Good morning. We want to pray for Bill also. You saw he didn't come off the pulpit when it was greeting time. He is battling with walking pneumonia. So uh, he will not be joining me at the door this morning. I've made that executive decision. <laughs> but we want to pray for him. Would the children like to come up for the children's story sermon? How you doing? Good, really? No, that's what I figured. You're never good. No, you're always good. You just never think you're... Oh, if you're not good, Mom and Dad put you in time out. <laughs> I've been there. From both sides of the equation, I think, yeah. Did you notice that we have the uh, white cloth up on the altar table today? You know why we have that white cloth there? No. Okay. Well, that's good. We're going to talk about today is a special day in the church. I mean, every Sunday is a special day in the church, but this is a special Sunday as well. It's called Worldwide Communion Sunday. What does it mean to be worldwide? How big is our world? Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. We live in, where do we live? What? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, exactly. We live in Pennsylvania. And we, today is a day that we remember that there are Christians who live not just in Pennsylvania or not just in the United States or not just in North America, but all around the world. In Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in South America, North America, Australia, all around the world, we have Christians. And so, they might not look the same as us, and they might not worship the same as us in terms of their songs might be different and things of that sort. We have the same Bible. We have the same Jesus. We have lots of things in common. And so today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. Now, we put that white cloth on there, and it sits over top. I'll show you. I'll give you a preview. It sits over top of some trays that have special things inside of them. Inside this tray are cups of grape juice, exactly. Yeah, you knew it, didn't you? Yeah. And what's in the other one? Bread, yeah. And inside this is, you're correct, a tray with bread in it. Why grape juice and bread? Amen. Did you hear that? So you can remember Jesus' blood when he died on the cross. That's exactly right. The, the grape juice reminds... <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. <laughs> the, the red grape juice reminds us of Jesus' blood, and the piece of bread reminds us of Jesus' body. W.C. Fields said, never appear on stage with children or an animal. <laughs> you guys are wonderful. I want you to know that. That's exactly right. And so today when we gather at the table of the Lord and we have our piece of bread and our little cup of grape juice, we will remember that Jesus died not just for us, but he died for everybody. He died for everybody, no matter where they live, or what country they're from, or what state they're in, and all of those kinds of things. He died for everybody, and we are grateful for that. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for the children, for the lessons that we learned together with them. Oh Lord, I ask for your blessing to be upon them, that they would continue to yearn and to understand even more about who Jesus is and how he has come to be their Savior and Lord as well. We ask for your blessing to be upon them now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may walk back to your seat. <laughs> I didn't mention you couldn't jump off the platform. <laughs> Our scripture lesson today is found in two places. 
In Philippians chapter 3, and reading there verses 4 through 14, and then Psalm 23, a psalm which most of us are familiar and perhaps have even memorized, but a psalm that still has much to teach us. Philippians chapter 3, and reading there beginning with verse 4, actually it's kind of in the middle of verse 4, you'll see a new paragraph start there, and we'll be reading from verse 4 through verse 14. Paul's epistle to the church at Philippi. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to hold that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I know what I'm about to tell you is going to be hard for you to imagine, but I was on the track team in high school. This was built for comfort, not for speed. (laughs) But I was on the track team. I was not a runner. I was what was called a weight man. I threw the shot put and discus in high school. For four years, I was on the track team, earned a varsity letter. My senior year... I finished second in the discus throw. That was my better event. I finished second in the discus throw of every meet I competed in until I got into the state competitions. I never won. I worked hard to win. I trained hard to win. I practiced hard to win. I threw and I threw and I threw. I lifted weights. I did everything I could. I could never win. The reason I couldn't win is because my teammates beat me every time. He ended up being number one in the state our senior year. Actually, he was number one in the state his junior year and number one in the state his sophomore year. He was very good. I would beat the competition most of the time my senior year by a foot, maybe 14 inches. That's a pretty significant victory when you're throwing the discus my teammate would beat me by 20 feet. I mean, it wasn't even close. I was convinced he could have thrown left-handed. He was right-handed. I was convinced he could have thrown left-handed and still beat me, because he did in practice. He was good. The great thing about him is he helped me. He was an encourager to me. 
I was not anywhere near his level and was never going to be anywhere near his level. But he would help me as we trained and as we practiced. He would say, Mike, I saw a little hitch in your giddy up kind of thing. Here's what I think you can do to get a little more distance. And we would practice those steps together. I mean, throwing discus is all about steps, form, speed, and strength. It's not just about strength. There were lots of people who were a lot stronger than me who could throw a discus, but couldn't throw it as far as I could. It had to be all of those things at one time. Now, I did do want to tell you, I did run once in a track meet. It was not pretty. It's downright ugly. My senior year, we're playing against Spring Grove. They were a big arch rival in track. They always had a great track team, and we did too. And it was the last meet of the year, the last dual meet of the year before we went to the regionals and then the states and all those kind of things. And at the end of the track meet, we were tied. We were undefeated coming into that meet. They were undefeated coming into that meet. Whoever's going to win that meet is going to be the county champion. At the end of the regular track meet, we were tied. Being tied is like kissing your grandmother. Not a lot of thrill there. So by a prearranged agreement, the decision was going to be made who was going to win this track meet, who was going to be the county champions, based upon what was called the weight man relay. Yeah. If you were a weight man who did not compete in any of the running events, and there were some weight men who were also had speed to them. You know, when I ran, they timed me by the calendar, not by the clock. <laughs> And we had to run this weight man relay to determine who's the county champion, and we each had to run a quarter of a mile. My goodness. A quarter of a mile? That's like forever. I probably did my quarter of a mile in three minutes. You know, maybe a little faster than that back then. And we we're lumbering along. And lumbering is the good word. And we elbowed our competition. Weren't supposed to do that either. I ran the third leg of a one mile relay. My buddy, who had legs that went like from here to the floor, ran the last leg of this competition and we won. And the whole team was standing around cheering for us not so slim guys, the weight men on this relay. The Apostle Paul says, I press on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Now, my question for you and my question for us is, for what has Christ Jesus taken hold of you? What is your purpose in life? What is the one thing that Christ has asked you to do and has called you to do? He has called every one of us to serve him in our life. And he has given us gifts so that we may serve him and serve the church by serving him. And we need to press on to take a hold of that for which he has taken hold of us. That's a fairly easy one for me. I know why Christ Jesus has called me. I know what it is that I do. And I know what it is that I'm going to spend my time doing. And that's, for me, it's preparation for preaching. It's the thing that I do. I do lots of other things, of course. Everybody does. You know, you can't just be a cook in a restaurant who cooks one thing. You may have one thing that is your specialty, but invariably someone's going to order something other than your one thing. And the restaurant's not going to hire you if you're only good at cooking one thing. For me, it's to preach. I spend my time, my energy, my effort in preparation for preaching. I study, I read, I work at it. 
It's the thing that I do. What is it for you? What is the one thing for which Christ has called you and the one thing for which you need to press on to take a hold of that thing for which Christ has asked you to do? There are no unimportant roles in the kingdom. They used to say about the theater, there are no insignificant actors. Everyone has significance. The Apostle Paul likens the church to the human body. He uses that analogy. And I want you to understand, and some of you do already, that as you get older, parts of your body don't function like they used to. How about our knees, John? When you get out of bed in the morning, your knee hurts when you're hobbling on your way to the bathroom, you know, or whatever. Yeah, I'm right there with you. As we get old, our bodies begin to wear out, and we suddenly realize that the knee is pretty important, or maybe it's your shoulder, or maybe it's your back, Charlie. Maybe it's something else about you, and you realize that all parts of your body are important. I want to tell you, if you've ever smashed your thumb with a hammer, your thumb is the most important part of your body right at that moment. You can't say, well, I'm just going to ignore the thumb because the rest of me is all good. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Everybody in the church, everybody who's a part of the kingdom has an important role in the body of Christ. And in order for us to do well, we need to press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of us. I used to hate the beginning of track season. If you've ever been on a track team, even if you're a weight man, the coach thinks you need to be able to run. Never have quite figured that one out. Baseball looked more attractive all the time. If only I could have hit, I'd have played baseball instead of been on the track team. And so we would run at the beginning of track season. We were doing that to get into shape, and we'd run five miles. Your first day out, you're running five miles. The second day out, you're running five miles. By the third day, you couldn't walk a mile, let alone walk five, or run five. You hurt. But it was a part of the training and the part of the strenuous nature of being involved in a sport like that, that prepared you and enabled you to succeed and to do better than what you could had you not been in shape. I'm fascinated with sports. I, I enjoy baseball, and right now it's a great time of the year to watch baseball. Sorry for the pirates, by the way. I like to watch baseball. I like to watch football. Those are all wonderful things, and I marvel at even the big men in football, how good a shape they are in, how fast they can run, all of those kinds of things. And they need to maintain peak performance to be able to do their jobs and to do it well. What about us? What is the thing that Christ has called us to do, the one thing for which he has taken hold of us that we need to press on to do and to do it well? Back in the mid-15th century, which are the years of about 1440 to 1480, there was a man who went to spend his life, dedicated his life to the Lord. He was going to serve as a priest. Remember, Protestant Reformation doesn't take place until the 1500s. So in the, 14, in the 1400s, this man is going to dedicate his life to the Lord. He's going to serve the Lord. He's going to be a priest. He knows the sacrifice of being a priest. He knows what that means. And he feels a particular call to go to the monastery. And he's going to spend the rest of his life in a monastery. I'm sure his, his desire and his aspirations in that monastery is that he is going to be one of those monks who sets aside his life to pray or sets aside his life to translate Scripture, or to set aside his life simply to read God's Word. Brother Lawrence goes to the monastery. 
And the abbot gives him the job of washing dishes. Really? You're going to devote your life to Christ? You're going to forsake your family, your friends? You're going to live your life in a monastery and your job is to wash dishes? How would you have felt if your brother Lawrence? Would you have been joyful? Would you have been happy? Would you have found peace and contentment and satisfaction in washing dishes when you think that you're going to be studying, you're going to be praying, you're going to be doing some of those higher things? Brother Lawrence washes dishes. How do I know that story? Because late at night, after everybody else has gone to bed, Brother Lawrence wrote in a journal. And that journal was maintained. And it is one of the great Christian devotional classics through the years. And in his journal, Brother Lawrence never complains about washing dishes. Hello. He doesn't complain that his job is to wash dishes and that other monks get the job of reading or praying or translating. He never once complains. This is the job that the Lord needs him to do. And with joy, he does it. How, how powerful is that lesson? What is it that God calls you to do? What is your job? Now, some of you are saying to me, Mike, listen, you don't understand. I'm old. Really? That's where you want to go? You still have a job. If you're still able to breathe and take nourishment and function, you still have a job. It may not be the same as what you used to do. We may not be able, I can't throw a discus anymore. If you put a discus in my hand, I'd maybe get it from here to Jeff. Maybe a little further. May hit Steve with it. Yeah, duck is right. I, I can't do what I used to do, but I can still do what God calls me to do, and so can you. God didn't call me to be a discus thrower. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun with it. Got to see a really good discus thrower. That's not the job he's called me to do. What is it that God has called you to do? Do it with joy. Press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. To do it. Now there is a story about a uh, young priest who goes to the monastery and it's a monastery that has taken a vow of silence. They're allowed to speak one day a year when the abbot tells them that they can speak, and they're allowed to say two words on that day. And so this young priest goes into the monastery, and he gets inducted in, and he has a whole year of silence. He's been good. He's been good the whole year. And finally, it's his one-year anniversary, and the abbot calls him into the office and says, you may speak two words. And the young priest said, food, cold. So the abbot says, okay, we'll see what we can do to improve the food. 
And so he goes through the whole next year. And it's his anniversary again, and the abbot calls him in and says, you may speak two words. And he said, bed hard. The abbot said, okay, we'll see if we can get you a new mattress sometime in the next year. Well, nothing changes. The food is still cold, the bed's still hard, and so he goes through his next year, and he finally comes to his anniversary, and the abbot calls him in, and the abbot says, you may speak two words. And the young priest looks at him and says, I quit. (laughs) And the abbot said, well, you might as well. All you ever do is complain. (laughs) (laughs) Is that what we do? When we have a moment with God's ear, Do we press on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of us? Guess what? You see me up here on this platform week after week, Sunday after Sunday. You see me in a hospital visiting someone. You see me whatever. Do you see everything else that takes to make this happen? Do you see Henrietta in here cleaning, scrubbing bathrooms? Think of that being your job. Back when Hen used to smoke, I understood that. If I had to clean toilets and urinals, and that'd be about enough, wouldn't it? Do you see Robin when she's in the office? typing up a bulletin, trying to gather information from the congregation so she can disseminate that announcements correctly? Do you see the committees who stand behind this? Who make sure that the property is taken care of and that the Christian education work is moving forward and that all of those kinds of things that happen as a part of the church make the church move? Do we see Amy over there in the nursery during Sunday school? And know that she's there week after week after week after week caring for those children who, who come. Do we see Cheryl in here mostly on Tuesday evenings paying bills? Writing checks? Do we see Bob Mowing grass, shoveling snow, don't even want to think about that. The whole ministry of this congregation extends beyond these walls and certainly extends beyond this platform. Because we are the body of Christ. Press on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of you. I don't know what your job is, necessarily. For some of you, you have a pretty good idea. But you do. And if you don't, I'll help you. I'll pray with you. We'll discover your spiritual giftedness. We'll find a job for you. Trust me, there are still lots of things available here to press on. Day after day, week after week, during track season, I'd go out there and do a 100 throws every day, striving to throw one inch further than I'd thrown the last competition. Sometimes I made it. Sometimes I didn't. But I was going to work my hardest and do my best to achieve that discus throw. 
knowing full well in my mind I was never going to win single competition. I mean, when, you're, when your teammate's throwing 20 feet beyond you, I mean, you just kind of know. You ain't going to win. I know you're supposed not to say that word, but you got it. But you try, and you try, and you try, and you try. You press on. Hallelujah, God didn't call me to be a discus thrower. I'm glad he called me to do what it is that I do. And I'm glad he calls you to do what it is that you do as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the love that you have shown us through Jesus. For the fact that each of us have a job to do and you encourage and strengthen us to be able to do that that you've called us to do. Lord, help the church to be the church that we might move forward in the kingdom, that we might proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those who have not yet heard it. And on today, when we look at Worldwide Communion Sunday and we see that the world is ripe unto harvest, we realize that we have an important job and a task to do. We thank you and we praise you for the call that you have extended to us. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Corinthians 11, the scripture says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had broken it, he gave thanks and said, This is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup and gave it to them and said, This is the blood of the new covenant. Drink this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now listen to this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to focus just for a second on that last phrase. When we gather at this table, we remember but we also anticipate. We remember that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. We remember that they were there to celebrate the Passover. We remember that he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper, but we also anticipate. For as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me until he comes. The Christian faith it's future-oriented. It's about living in eternity with Him. We invite any and all who profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord to join with us as we gather at the table with the ushers come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this bread and this cup, for they do indeed remind us of Jesus' body and his shed blood. Help us, Lord, as we receive them, to remember that he alone has paid that price for us. In Jesus we pray, amen. Take and eat.
Jesus said, this is the blood of a new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we return thanks to you for that which you have done, that which you and you alone could do. The giving of your only begotten Son to be our Savior and our Lord. We give you thanks. Amen. Lord, as we go, Lord, as we go into a world that rests and waits for the good news, may we go and bear that good news that they will know that we are Christians by the way that we live our lives, by the way that we love one another, and by the way that we share Jesus with them. Be with us as we go. In Christ we pray. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.